So yeah, originally I come from Brixton, Stockholm Park Estate. I come from originally a very powerful family, a powerful network of people. And a lot has happened over the course of time. It was no joke. Brixton was no joke. It was a war zone at one point. And then we're dealing with then at that time, the Yardies were coming over. And so how we dealt with violence at one point, it changed the temperature. But when the Yardies came over, it became straight gun violence because that's what they brought from where they came from. All of a sudden, it's like we have to, well, you know, we have to step our game up. The rules has now changed. You come from kings, you come from queens. So I want you to think like that. Never think like a thug, never act like a thug. Think mm. powerful. Freedom to express, the freedom to be, the freedom not to be controlled, the freedom to just absolutely create what you want to create without anyone kind of saying to you, you're not allowed to be a creator. I will make a decision and it will hurt someone and I will make another decision and someone will love me for it. So I think I'd always have enemies. When we sat down one time, he says, Kevin, if I die, never cry for me. And I said, why? He says, because we know the game we play. And so when you're winning, you're not crying then. So if I ever lose, do not cry. So when I first got stabbed, I, I actually died on the operating table. There was no argument or conflict with, with this person. They cut me and just ran off. You can't defend against stuff like that. So part of my nose fell off. That to restitch my nose back on. Another time when I got uh, stabbed in my leg, I was actually kicking the knife out of someone's hand who's trying to stab someone else. And, it's, and I managed to get stabbed in my leg. So where your focus goes, your energy flows. Focus on what you love and love will love you in return. Focus on what you hate and hate will come to visit you. Welcome to, this is the first for us. We've got Kevin in the studio. He's never told his story in full before. There's clips of things here and there. And I think what you just said was so brilliant, Kevin. <laughs> the synopsis. <laughs> Could you just say it again, please? <laughs> We're going to let you know what's coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my name's Kevin Bennett. So first and foremost, thank you for having thank me. You. I really yeah, appreciate you it. Coming. You guys, what you're doing is absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, originally I come from Brixton, Stockholm Park Estate. Um, and I think just like majority of people, we've all got a past, we've got a history. And um, I come from originally a very powerful family, a powerful network of people. And a lot has happened over the course of time. And, um, you know, people, rest in peace to my brother Andy. He passed away, he got killed. And, um, you know, quite a few other friends, people. Just, I, I guess, for majority of us nowadays has, has lost people in all yeah. different ways. And um, even for myself, I've been stabbed five different times. Sorry, four, I keep saying five, it's actually four. The other, the other one don't count. So, um, <laughs> so uh, four, four different times. And... Um, you know, I, I guess we live in a world now where it's like if your scenarios don't build you, it's going to break you. And so we choose our paths. And I think with my journey, my path turned more to the left and it turned to the right kind of thing. So, you know, now I'm helping thousands of people globally. I work with governments, organizations, companies. And it's not just from like an inspirational, conversational perspective. It's more from a perspective now where I'm helping people that's going through depression, people that's going through, and there's nine different types of depression, but people that's going through trauma, that's experienced traumatic experiences. And so um, governments has called me and I've spoken in the House of Parliament before. I've spoken on like, um, you know, different news networks around the world. I've worked with, with all different type of people. So for me, my, my journey, we all have a past, but the future is is what is really powerful for me at this precise time. And that's what we love about you. It's not just, you know, the synopsis. There's a lot of mayhem there and um, craziness. But Kevin is a really powerful speaker. And when you hear the magnitude of what he's accomplished and his transformation, once we get through his life story, it is breathtaking. Definitely. So, born and raised in Brixton, then? Did yeah, Stockholm Park Estate. Yeah. And so we're talking like, you know, I was born in the 70s. So I'm a 70s baby, uh, late 70s. Um, 80s was discovering self, 90s was absolutely mayhem. <laughs> and so back then, you know, in the 90s, you know, you had all... Uh, see, here's the thing, like, if, if you go back and understand, for example, where a lot of our Jamaican heritage come from. So you got, like, the 60s. 
back in the 60s, a lot of Jamaicans came over. 50s, 60s, right? And so you, they had to deal with no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. That's the headspace. That's the situation. So a lot of them, when they was having children, our parents and parents' friends, they were more in survival mode. And so they were bringing up their children and they were just trying to work and bring up their children. Now, when you're going into like the late 60s, 70s, then you had to deal with racism. And so the Brixton riots came from that racism. And so people that are not in a place of excellence at that time, they're in a place of um, survival. And so when you're going through survival in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there's no space for racism for most black people, Africans, Caribbeans, and even Indians, because a lot of Caribbeans were defending Indians at that time as well. So there was a level of kind of camaraderie in that sense, people coming together to try and help each other to get to the next stage. So when we came around, you know, in the 90s and started to discover ourselves, we didn't have the intelligence around us. It was more about our older generation was more in a place of trying to still work themselves out. So when there were like a lot of wars and stuff kicking off, there wasn't really a, a high level of intelligence that was there. It was just more kind of like we're fighting against the police because of the racism and the Cherry Gross and the Mark, uh, was it the Wayne Douglas? Wayne or Mark Douglas, I think. Mark Douglas, right? It was Mark Douglas. And so we're dealing with those kind of things. And then we're dealing with then at that time, the Yardies were coming over. And so how we dealt with violence at one point, it changed the temperature because, you know, if someone was getting stabbed back in the, 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 the 80s and the 90s, it was never to be penetrated. It was like a wet. It's, like a, it's kind of like you're going to wet them in their face or you're going to stab them in their leg or you're going to stab them in their arm. But when the Yardies came over, it became straight gun violence because that's what they brought from where they came from. And so all of a sudden, the temperature and the gauge starts to change. All of a sudden, it's like we have to, well, you know, we have to step our game up because the rules has now changed. And so the whole environment starts to change and the way people think and act starts to change. And then it brings a whole different level of um, problems. And then books were written based upon people around me, you know, like um, the Yardies and all the rest of it. So a lot of books were started to be written at that time because of the temperature change, the gauge. And then as time went on, um, people become notorious mm. because you come from survival mode to a place where you're like, okay, I'm in a, a position of power. And when you're in a position of power, then you have to exercise accordingly. So you start to, you start to do things that you don't even realize is going to cause long-term ripple effects because things that's happening from the eighties and nineties are affecting children now. Of course. You know? And you were born in the seventies then. 77. So what was your first memories? Mm. Uh, from what perspective? Like, if you look back now at your yeah. entire memories bank, what was the first things you remember? Do you know what? I remember, I kid you not, I remember five years old lying in my mum's bed and the police, gun police coming in. And it's a, see, you don't take it as serious as your family does. In your mind, it's a game. It's a game. And I remember at the time, my brother had a passport because he was flying out a couple of days after and the passport was right there and I don't know why but I picked up the passport and I just pushed it down and, and I actually saved him from his passport because they was part of looking for that as well because they knew he was flying <laughs> out so you, you're kind of conditioned from young you, you're aware of certain things but you don't know the level of magnitude it is but you just have a level of awareness and so from young I had brothers and a network of people around me who will teach me things in certain particular ways, but it wasn't from a fuggery perspective. They were very educated. So it wasn't like a, a straight, this is how we are, we're fugs. They were educated in many different ways. So I remember being eight years old and being taught about the G7. And they said, if you want to understand people, understand how the G7 works, the G7 countries. So how, understand how Russia works, understand how America works, how understand how Great Britain works. And if you understand their problems, then you can understand how to solve them. So this would teach me the problems of the different countries and how to look at countries, etc. Then over the years, I started to get different mentors globally, which they created for me. 
So it was a place where when they were teaching me things, they used to say to me, listen, do you know your historical background? You come from kings, you come from queens. So I want you to think like that. Never think like a thug, never act like a thug. Think mm. powerful. And so as the years went on, I was I became very strategic in the, the, the things I would do and I had a lot of pride in it, nevertheless. We always make colossal mistakes at times, but it was one of those scenarios. So that was like my early years, you know, police raiding the house that's and all those kind of things that was happening. Why were they raiding the house? Do you know? Um, I don't remember. There were no. so many things that was happening. I don't remember. Um, and then as, as time went on, they I was taught how to do surveillance and anti-surveillance because, <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. Wow. So I remember my brother used to say to me, we need you to have a great memory and I'll need you not to smoke or drink. So even up until this current day, I don't smoke, I don't drink. And so it's so funny in your earlier years, what I call your developmental years, whatever you're taught stays. That's what stays. And so he used to say to me, I don't need you to smoke. I don't want you to be like everyone. Do not smoke. Do not drink. I need you to have a photographic memory. So what we used to do, he used to make me walk down the road and he would say, right, what's the last 10 things or 20 things you can remember about the last 20 people that used to walk past? And over a course of time, I used to have a photographic memory where I can say, right, that person was like this, that person like that. And so over time, when we used to get surveillance, I used to see straight away what was going on. I'd be like, that woman was there before. She had a red top on and now she's got a green top on and her hair's been changed. So she's clearly gone down the road, <laughs> gone around the corner and come back yeah. wearing this particular thing. And so I started to learn things from that perspective. We used to go in a shop and I could pretty much memorize everything that was going on. And so over the years, I wouldn't say that I was brought up i was in an environment like stoker park estate whoever knows about stoker park estate brixton angel town etc going back into the 90s it was no joke brixton was no joke it was a war zone at one point because what it was that the reason why it, it became such a war zone because people discovering themselves at that time that mm -hmm. was the first generation that was starting to discover themselves and it was the first generation where outsiders came in and caused a lot of problems it was very community based before that and so you start to find new ways to survive, but then you start to find new ways to understand how dominance work. Some people had a way of fuggery and some people had a way of being strategic about it. And it and it manifested over the years. Yeah. This is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> what were you like in school then? What was your first school? Um, so, this is interesting. I originally... Um, I got into a school called London Nautical. Now, London Nautical was like, back then, it was equivalent of a private school. And it was like, wow. However. <laughs> <laughs> Is that due to your photographic memory? No, it, it, was, just, it was just sheer luck. Yeah. However. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, there was another school called Dick mm. Shepherd. Mm. And Dick Shepherd was the worst school you can possibly go to. Now, my friends were going Dick Shepherd. I got accepted into London Nautical. I chose Dick Shepherd. And so, because you don't know, you're young and you just, you want, just to want to be around your friends. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and at that time, you know, my mum didn't really understand the schooling system from that perspective back then. You know, she came from Jamaica and all she knows, go to school and your, and your teacher's going to teach you. So she didn't understand how, you know, environments can cause, traumatic environments can, can cause problems and trauma for yourself so the first day that I stepped into that school so Dick Shepherd you know you had Brixton then you go into Tulse Hill Dick Shepherd was in Tulse Hill and so when I went into to Dick Shepherd it was just like mayhem the first day I got there was a fight and I had a fight it was years I don't remember like year 11 and stuff like that I was like it was like first year second year up to fifth year um and I got in fight with a fifth year boy and I was and I see I think about this a lot should I have won that fight or should I have lost that fight? What was because, the fight over? No, no, it's just like you come in and it's straight dominance. Like uh. they drag your bag and they're throwing you around. And so that, I was so scared, but I was also so conditioned. So my conditioning is we don't play with Stoker Park State. But I was so scared because I'm young. When you go into a secondary school in your first year, you're young. The whole world is big. The chairs are big. The school is big. Everyone is big. And so I won that fight. So sometimes I ask myself, was winning that fight good or was that winning that fight bad? Because it started to condition the way you go on from there. All of a sudden, 
They wanted to bring people down from other schools. He's a good fighter. He's a good fighter. So then it becomes your reality. And then as you... Um, and that's what happened to a lot of people nowadays, if you think about it. Sometimes their their moment of winning becomes their long-term traumatic lifestyle. And so that's what happened to me. I couldn't focus in school. I couldn't truly elevate in school. But that school wasn't designed for people to elevate. The same teacher who was the head teacher of that school, everyone knew him as a racist man. When he eventually left that school, he got stabbed up and killed um, by a Chinese kid, I believe, in another school. So if you research him, his name was uh, Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Lawrence, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was absolutely notorious. What sort and of things so, would he say? It wasn't about saying, it was It was the zero tolerance, but you can see the, 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 the contrast of... of tolerance for like white children that was doing well uh, well white children that were struggling and black children that were struggling so black children was not allowed to make mistakes it was straight suspension or expelled and it wasn't like anything major it was just making mistakes you could be turning up late to school and it's straight away it's like zero to 100 but another kid was late to school and it was okay tell me what happened okay don't worry about it we'll work it out be better next time so um you know majority of us got expelled from school i went over to another school called michael ramsey and when i got to um archbishop um it was a very interesting journey because it was the complete opposite in a sense so we had a teacher in michael ramsey who's a black lady she looks like my mother she was around the same age as my mother but she had an absolute despise as well for for me and i thought it was just me it's only years later when i left the school other people saying that how she treated me was how she treated majority of people so then it 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 kind of like i started to not look at life as black and white from that perspective i looked at life as frequencies you know who's in a negative frequency because it doesn't matter what color you are and who's in a positive frequency it doesn't matter what colour you are. So, for example, you'll see in most white communities, the violence amongst white people and white people is high. And in black communities, it's black and black crime. In Chinese communities, it's Chinese and Chinese violence. In Indian communities, it's the same thing. So there's always going to be a level of anger, hate, resentment, and all the rest of it in each community against each other. So I stopped looking at black and white from that perspective, not fully, but I wanted to more look at the people beside me are they good for me from a frequency perspective or are they bad for me from a frequency perspective? And I've discovered over time that more white people over a course of time has helped me when I've gone through trauma than a lot of people that I thought is around me and would support me. They're the, if anything, they're the ones that have caused me, uh, caused me the trauma. Mm. What subjects were you interested in? Um, maths. Maths. I think anyone that comes on road likes maths. <laughs> <laughs> anyone that comes on road likes maths. They didn't like maths in school, um, but they they like maths over over a percentage of time. Um, over a percentage of time. Over a time. Um, do you know the funny thing is? I wanted really to learn in school, and it's very hard to learn in school when you're in a negative environment. Very, very hard. Very hard. Um, and so I think when I left school, I went back to education. Could you go back? To, when you go to college, it's under your, it's on your grounds. When you're in school, everything's on the grounds of others. So it's a lot harder to conform when the environment is not a conforming type of environment. Did you know what you wanted to do? I wanted, um, I wanted freedom. I wanted freedom. And, and I, I understood from a very young age that freedom could mean anything at any time. Yeah. Freedom could mean anything at any time. And so what I mean by that is like, if you think from entrepreneurial perspective, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Is it because of money or is it because of freedom? Now, when you're young, you believe it's because of money. But when you're older, you realize it's because of freedom. It gives you a lot of free time. Freedom to express, the freedom to be, the freedom not to be controlled, the freedom to just absolutely create what you want to create without anyone kind of saying to you you're not allowed to be a creator and so even when I was back in Michael Ramsey this particular teacher she used to say to me every single day you're going to be in prison by the time the age of 18 and she told me that every single day of the week and so some people may say well maybe she was trying to inspire you not to <laughs> but no it wasn't no. she told me every single day of the week you're going to end up in prison one day and I can't wait to see you when you end up in prison. And I think that was when I, I created my first core value that I made for myself. 
and the first core value I created was because of this particular teacher is when your attitude's right, the facts don't count. And what that means is, as long as my attitude's right, her facts don't count. And so sometimes in life, people create um, a reality about you without you knowing it. And so you have to create core values in order for you to say, right, I would never, ever, ever conform to what you believe is going to happen to me. Because that could have put a lot of children down that. No, it and did. sent them down a really bad path. It did. Yeah. It did. It did. I, it did. Um, see, Michael Ramsey was, you know, was right next to Peckham, right next to Brixton, right next to Kennington. It was kind of in between. And so you had all different types of personality. And what people don't realise is when children are going to school, they're going to school sometimes off the weight of what's going on at home. So you don't know what's going on at home for a lot of children. Some children are being abused. Some children don't have no light. Some children don't have no food. Some children don't have no gas. Some children don't have no confidence. And so when you go to school and you're in an environment of school, the one thing that teachers cannot do is destroy your self-confidence because they don't know what's tipping you over the edge. They don't know where you're coming from. And so I think what hurt me, if it was a white teacher that said it to me, it would have been easier. But when a black teacher said it to me who looked like my mother, who was similar age to my mother, that was heartbreaking. And that changed a lot for me when it comes to how I started to look at the world around me. Very positive. Mm. Did you get into sports? Um, yeah, I used to do like 100 and 200 meters. Um, I played a bit of football at two left feet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I used to do some sports. Sports was therapeutic for me. It was good. It was good. And what was your goal for when you finished school? My goal, so let's go back just a bit. Um, I used to be a part of like the reggae sound system. Okay, so in my early years, you know, whoever knows, back back then, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, you had Eiches, you had Coxon, you had Saxon, you had all these big boy Jamaican British sound systems so I grew up under those and so we had a sound called Sovereign Syndicate now I was like the second generation in Sovereign Syndicate and Sovereign Syndicate um it was very interesting it, it was like we was playing against whoever understands the world it was the greatest thing ever it was our escape so Sovereign Syndicate you had um, different sounds around the world. So at the time, you had sounds like Bodyguard, Super D. You had all these different sounds, which was from Jamaica. You had Addis, that was from America. And then um, you had all these different sound systems. So then you have World Sound Clash. You had all of this. And it, once again, it's the greatest experience ever when you understand it. You know, even if you don't understand it, there's still a great experience to it. So I was a part of Sovereign Syndicate and we were growing up the ranks. And we started to play alongside sounds like Addis and Super D and all the rest of it. It's the equivalent of like playing like alongside Ronaldo, yeah? So just to give you some level of understanding. And so we was playing against all these different sound systems and was playing alongside them. And then it creates you great notoriety globally around the world. And so whilst we was doing that, um, then my older brothers, they started to put on concerts. So we started to put on concerts with Bound to Killer, Snoop Dogg, all the rest of it. So there was like Brixton, uh, Brixton Academy, we put on shows. Then we put on shows in the Recreation Centre. Then we put on all these different shows. And so that was good. But once again, I knew within myself I wasn't inspired. I wanted to do more. And so then um, I started to go deeper into the music industry. We started to do production work, etc. And um, we started to, I started to work with groups like m and um, and that wasn't like me, so I wasn't the main person, but I was behind the scenes working alongside the main producers, Honeys, um, Eternal, all those kind of groups from back then. So that was good. And I was like, no, I even want even more. So then um, I went back to college and um, in college, um, it was Norwood College at the time. Um, I was studying engineering because, you know, once again, I was really happy about that. And I was in the cl I was in um, the college with gigs and all those guys. And we was all hanging out and working out engineering in college. Then I moved on from college and I went to Morley College to study instruments. But um, yeah, once again, my two left feet was equivalent of how I played music as well. So that wasn't <laughs> great. Um, and so, yeah, I moved on from that. And then I went into management side of things in the music industry. That was great. But it just felt for me, and it was also slightly the wrong time. Like mu the music industry now was ideal, but there were so many gatekeepers back then that it was, it was a painful journey. I think we are in the best time ever in human history when it comes to self 
expressing self and being paid for it. Mm. But back, even back then, if you're going back 15 years, there were still the gatekeepers that were there. And so once again, I just felt like there's too much gatekeepers. I want to move away and try other things. And that's, I opened up my own studio. That was going well. And then um, we started up an event called Chilling. And um, Chilling, every single week, every single month in Chilling, we had a main performer. This was at the Fridge um, nightclub in, in, uh, in Brixton. Every single month we had Casey and Jojo, Drew Hill, Puff Daddy. Everyone came down to perform. You know, it was an under 18s event. And so, you know, there was a whole historical background when it comes to my musical world. Then I just walked away from it. I said, I wanted more for um, my community. I wanted more. Like we were all just known for music, music, music. And I was like, no, like, why don't we have any musical lawyers in the black community? Why don't we have no managers? Why don't we have no um, no um, distribution teams? So I kind of wanted to go into things a bit more. And because I had my early years of... Um, understanding how the world works, I started to travel the world and I started to get mentors from all over the world, from China, from Bulgaria, from Belgium. And they started to teach me different aspects of the world. And I started to look at things, not from a local view anymore, but from a worldview. And as the world started to open up to me, it allowed me to understand human behavior from a whole different level. And then I just went in studying the, um, the science of how the mind works and helping people with depression. And when I started to look back at my past and look at all my, well, majority of my friends who I grew up with, I realized a lot of people weren't as angry as I believed they were, or they were as bad as I believed they were. They were traumatized. They were going through trauma. So I dedicated my life, life after that to helping people that was going through mental and emotional trauma. Wow, that's powerful. So going back, uh, when was the first time you were in trouble with the police? Um... I just think like most things in life, I just think like most people um, in our environment, just by living on an estate, you're always going to walk through some form of problem overall. So yeah. I just think like most people just get in trouble by the police in general. But I, I, for me, I've never been in trouble for anything that is worth notoriety. I've never been in that in that position. You know, the level of what other people's gone through, I'm, I feel actually blessed. I would never try to compare my my journey of, of being in trouble in comparison to other people. But, you know, as I said, we've, we've all gone through an element of of um, being in trouble, but mine has never been major enough for me to go to prison or anything like that. It's silly shit. Do you know what it is? Silly's relative. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, relative. it's relative. Yeah. Yeah. And then these these people, you know, in the introduction you said you had some obviously you had some enemies to yes. do these attacks on you. Sure. How did that come about with these enemies? Do you know your friends' enemies are your enemies. Mm. Your family's enemies are your enemies. And and it's it started off um going back from biblical times and it will continue to when houses can fly and have their own parking spaces <laughs> so um I, I i just believe overall that we're always gonna have enemies your 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 level of success and notoriety you've got enemies and you don't even know it right now yeah you know yeah. just don't smile too much because you're gonna have an enemy <laughs> you know and and don't frown too much because another enemy is gonna pop up mm. so enemies will always pop up at all times Trials. um and i believe like from a young age i was very good at creating finance and um and that created enemies i mean i had like a porsche when i was 17 years old mm. oh wow you know i had all those kind of particular things and and do you think it was jealousy there's always going to be jealousy there's always going to be jealousy um so jealousy is a major part of it sometimes sometimes you're just an arsehole <laughs> and you've just you've just been bad to someone like i would never turn around and pretend that i've always been this this stand-up guy sometimes i was an arsehole and and I've apologized to many people over the years because of it. When you become, when you know better, you do better. But sometimes I'm an arsehole and I deserve to have enemies. And other times I didn't deserve to have enemies. And it's going to continue that way. I will make a decision and it will hurt someone. And I will make another decision and someone will love me for it. So I think I'd always have enemies. And it's mm. fine. Enemies is not a bad thing. It's when they try to attack you. That's when it's a, it's a, it's a bad idea. And you're talking about your attack um, earlier, your stabbing. Yeah. How did that happen? come about I've, I've, I've never been stabbed because of me 
Right. I, someone's never set out of their house and said, today I'm going to stab Kevin. It's always been me defending someone. Mm. So when I first got stabbed, I, I actually died on the operating table. What? Um, no, not the first time. So when I, one of the main times I got stabbed is because one of my friends was having a fight. Um, and I didn't want him to fight because I knew it was a lose-lose. We was in an environment where there was probably about nine of them and there was two of us, but he was so emotionally um, depleted and he was so partially drunk that he's not realizing that there's a problem. Now, bear in mind, I don't smoke or drink and I've got a great memory. So when I'm looking around, I can see who those people are. They're all together and they were twice our age as well. So I was trying to stop him from a disaster. And so when he pushed the, 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 the situation even further, he was getting beaten up. I had to jump in. And all I said to him is watch my back. Then I turned around and he was gone. And one of the guys that was with the person that I'm fighting for, like fighting against for, stabbed me in my back. And um, yeah, I blacked out. Some people who knew me was driving past. They saw me, they brought me to a hospital. I died as soon as I got to the hospital, they resuscitated me back to life. So that was one of my moments. No, I didn't see any special lights. No dragons came towards me or anything <laughs> like that. I just remember waking up. For it to be that serious, what whereabouts in the back did it go in? Just underneath my heart. Oh. Just underneath. So it just missed it. Um, another time I got cut in my face. Um, and that was me once again defending someone. Um, and I didn't know I got cut in my face. The person just cut me in my face and ran off. So there was no actual just conflict. Walked up, stabbed. Yeah, and run. it ran out. Yeah. So once again, you can't really defend against those scenarios. Where were you on that occasion? Um, there was a there was a cl there was a pub in Peckham. Funny enough, the the the, the pub. Um, I know you must know the name of the pub. <laughs> what was it called? Warmer Castle. Warmer Castle. Castle. Yes, there was a pub called, um, in Warm um, called Warmer Castle in Peckham. And once again, there was a conflict with, with someone that's close to me. And I was trying to partially stop the conflict. But once again, it's like, sometimes when you're stopping something, you become an enemy. And um, try to stop the conflict. It was a, actually, it was a week before, there's a guy that we all know growing up called Duffer. So it was a week before Duffer d died in the exact same place. So um, yeah, it, it, it was a scenario where I tried to stop a situation. It got out of hand. Then they went back and called someone then the person came. There was no argument or conflict with, with this person. They cut me and just ran off. You can't defend against stuff like that. So part of my nose fell off. They had to restitch my nose back on and do constant surgeries. So, um, yeah, it's one of the reasons why I snore at night now because my, my nasal passage <laughs> is, 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 yeah, <laughs> is, is so bad. Another time when I got uh, stabbed in my leg, I was actually kicking the knife out of someone's hand who's trying to stab someone else and, it's, and I managed to get stabbed in my leg. Clearly, I wasn't good at <laughs> martial arts at that point in my life. Do you know why they were trying to stab the someone else? It's just It was a school situation. Mm. So it's just, once again, nothing makes... See, most things, if you look back, it doesn't make no logical sense and it's just emotional. And so that's what happened. And another time, which was probably the funniest time where I got stabbed, was um, <laughs> I had a friend that I brought to um, Jamaica with me. He's actually a white guy, but he's like a white black guy, one of those guys. And um, all of these girls were just loving him. They didn't want interested in me because he's the rich white guy. So like <laughs> he was very good at getting men's girls off of them. And one day guys came from another area called Rocky Point. They came over and they was like, today we're going for this guy. And I, once again, I was like trying to fight them off, help my friend out, and they got stabbed me in my arm. And so um, that time was more like, bro, I told you to leave those girls alone. So it was more of a, a moment where you laugh about it than, than the other times it was more serious. And you're like, okay, we've got to analyze what we're going to do next there. So, so you've literally been cutting every single part of your body. There, your back, Well, let's not say face. every part of my body because I don't want to start finding out there's new spaces to be cut. Yeah? So, <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, let's uh, yeah, leave it as that. And no more stabbing. When, when, you know, you were, you died, I mean, what, what are you going through? What's going through your head? I mean, you come back to life and what are you thinking? Like, are you fearing death? Do you, do you when you're is, is it a life changing thing or you just get on with your life? You get on with your life. See, here's the thing. When you are in survival mode, everything is survival. It's only now when you get older, you can understand what living is. But when you're young, most things are about survival. So you kind of don't respect quality of life and also the quality of people around you, their happiness. You don't, you don't respect it. 
there's not much people when they're in survival mode understand the quality of the happiness of your parents, the quality of the happiness of your loved ones. You don't think that way. It doesn't work that way. And most of the time, you don't think about, if you're in survival mode, you don't think about um, what happens to you next. You're just in survival mode. And so, no, you just you just stitch yourself back up. And I remember there was, there was a conflict that happened. Like, so I died as, another time, but it was away from that. My my um, appendix burst and poisoned me. So I've got a scar going up me. And, um, and once again, that's another time I stopped breathing. And I'll tell you how much we don't understand the level of not understanding. Even though my stitches were fresh, I'm out with my friends and my people. There's a big fight. We're all throwing punches. And the guy goes to hit me. And I go, no, 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 no. You can't hit me. You can't hit me. <laughs> then I pull up my top and he sees the scar. And then he bats off. Then I throw a punch again. So it's like, you don't, you don't really think about the quality of life when you're in those moments. You're young. Your genuine rush is, is, is going. You've got a commitment to your friend. You've got a commitment to your community. Whatever you call your community. What you got your commitment to all of that. And then you, and then you get older. Mm. And then you look at life and you respect the happiness of your loved ones. You start to respect your health. You start to respect certain things. So you become a lot more pensive in your decisions. Mm. So what was big bro Andy like? Powerful. He was probably the most educated, powerful man I know. Um, I remember him. He died when he was about 33. Mm. But it's a bit like when you think about Tupac, for example. His level of maturity, you never think that he was 25 because most people can't even match his level of intelligence now. Now, Andy's level, he had one of the highest IQ levels I've ever come across. And I've traveled the world. I've gone over 25, 30 countries. And he's probably the most intelligent person I've ever come across. So he was powerful. He was strategic. He had a lot of soldiers around him from all over different parts of the world. Um, and he was really, really powerful. I think he was ahead of his time. And I think that's what was probably s slightly part of, of his demise. He was too smart for his environment. And I think sometimes in life, it's a bit like Man Manchester United playing in the fourth division. When they lose, it's a bad idea. It's like, how can you lose? You're Man United. But if you're playing in the fourth division for too long, you're going to lose against someone. And I think his level of intelligence, his level of power, his level of finesse, was was too powerful for his environment and and when it went wrong it went wrong you know um and you, you can't like people said to me why don't you mourn the way that everyone else mourned and me and my brother used to sit down all the time he's the one that taught me about the g7 he taught me about how to play chess he taught me many different things and um when we sat down one time he says kevin if i die never cry for me and i said why he says because we know the game we play and so when you're winning, you're not crying then. So if I ever lose, do not cry. And even though I had my tearful moments, I never truly cried because for most people, know the game you play and don't moan when you lose. Because when you're winning, you're not being you're not mourning in those moments. So when he died, I mourned, but I we knew the game. And it was just that. You you move on, you become better, you become smarter. You become more strategic. You know who your friends are. You start to make decisions that is going to be in accordance to where you want things to go, not where things were. What were the circumstances surrounding his death? Uh, some people went in his shop and shot him to death. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, he just he got killed. And um, that was that. We, we knew something was coming. We was aware of it. How, I remember how were you I'm, aware of it? Do you know what? You, you, there's two sides of it. You always know when you're in conflict. But there's, there's, there's different type of conflicts that you have. You have spiritual conflicts as well. You know spiritually when something's going to go wrong. So I knew something was going to go wrong. I gave him a bulletproof vest the day before he died. And he says, I'm not wearing it. He says, when it's my time, it's my time. He died the next day. So um, wow. once again, we knew something was coming. Um, but something was always coming. The year before that, something was coming. The year before that, something was coming. Why is that? Because it's the it's the game people play. It's it's the game we play. You know, you can't you can't be it, it's like I, I say this to people, right? I always say this to females, yeah? And I say to I say to women, would you like to be 
the wife of a president and they all say yes no yeah and a lot of them <laughs> apart from yourself and a lot of them say, and I ask a question would you like to be the wife of a prime minister and they say yes because it's great and it's inspirational until they've got to sit down and work out that that prime minister has to make a decision where a hundred thousand people may die and you've got to sleep with it and you, the, the president may make a decision where for the next 25 years people may die of famine so when you're in a position of power you're going to make decisions where it's going to hurt harm and cause problems to other people he was in a very powerful position so when you're when you're president you're always going to have threats coming your way directly and indirectly and when you're prime minister you're always going to have threats coming your way and that's why even when you you stop being a prime minister or a president you still have security it doesn't the, the threats doesn't stop so when you're in a position of power in any world or any environment you're going to be vulnerable to attacks and it just so happens that this particular attack worked and others didn't so jen how does a free case of beer sound sounds absolutely fantastic after the longest january on record and some testing times there's nothing better than after a podcast sitting back and enjoying some craft pilsner delivered to my door so let's face it we all deserve a party from time to time and there's nothing like these very sesty, gluten-free pills and the beers. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers! Cheers! Grab a case for free, courtesy of our pals at Beer52, by going to www.beer52.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. S-H-A-U-N. And covering the <laughs> meagre postage cost of £5.95. Beer 52 is the biggest beer club in the world. Each month they send their members a case of beer from a different part of the world. And this month, it's an absolute belter. The great European road trip case takes in the best beer from across the continent. Try a crisp, refreshing Pilsner from Norway's Lervig Brewery and a monster 7.5% double IPA from Sweden's Duges Brewery. On the dark side this month, there's a smooth coffee stout mm. from Copenhagen's Tuul. <laughs> you pronounced that right. There is also beer from Croatia, Poland, Germany, Serbia and Australia, among others. If dark beer is not your thing, you can choose the light only case. Also included is the ever insightful Ferment magazine and a couple of tasty snacks. Even if, after all that, you're still unsatisfied, you can simply pause or cancel any time. That's www.beer52.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. So it's beer, B-E-E-R, 52.com forward slash Sean. I'm going to try some now. Ooh, those hops are amazing. That's really nice. Link is in the description box. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. Cheers. Did he have any partner, children, anything? Yeah, 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 children. Children? Yeah. How sad. Yeah, yeah. It's sad, it's sad, it's sad, you know. But, how, um, how old were you at the time of the funeral? 2021. 2021. Oh, Christ, that's young. Yeah. And so his early teachings actually taught me a lot because we ended up holding a newspaper... And so it was very, very political at that time when he died because he was around a lot of politicians as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, as I said, he was extremely smart um, and he was very strategic and he was very powerful. So he would be a part of like helping a, a, a mayor at that time, whoever can work out the mayor was back at that time, um, to come into power. And, th and there's many different things that he was doing from, you know, a very powerful perspective. That's what I said, it wasn't fuggery. The, he was strategically powerful at the age of 33 and that's when he died so imagine the years going backwards leading to that extremely extremely powerful extremely extremely smart and so um the early years that he taught me about anti-surveillance and surveillance i found secret services following me for a long period of time for about two to two and a half and uh, two and a half to three years and so when you when you are a chess player, sometimes you got to know when it's stalemate. So I used to just go college and I'd be like, follow me to college every day because I know your funding is going to run out. <laughs> and so I used to just go college every day. I used yeah. to go to um, um, Fairfield, uh, uh, Croydon College. And so 
they followed me for about a year and a half, two years until they stopped. Because I knew, once again, when you understand how chess works four or five steps ahead, you knew another person is going to occupy their time at some point. And so as times went on, the new set of gangs came up, PDC came up, all these people came up and they changed their focus and stuff. And I knew, okay, I've got a bit of freedom, space to breathe now. Mm. And, and so, so, so it was. <sighs> So we interviewed uh, Pablo Escobar's son, and when his dad died, he got, went on the radio and said, I'm going to avenge this and blah, 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 and it, yeah. which was a huge mistake. Yeah. What was going through your head when Andy died? Were you thinking anything along those lines? Or were you thinking, this is a lesson to stay away from that? Yeah, I mean, emotional people are not smart, and smart people are not emotional. So, you know, Pablo Escobar's son saying that was a really bad idea. But yeah, emotional people are not smart, and smart people are not emotional. So it's just it's just a part of life. You just get on with it. So I've got to be unemotional. Well, here's the thing: you, you're you're allowed to be emotional mm. in your relationship, but you're not allowed to be emotional when you're making decisions over or for people's lives. Definitely. So it sounds like you had a massive influence on you then. Andy. Yeah, yeah, massive, massively, yeah. massively, mm. massively. Yeah. Up until now, massively. Yeah. You know, but I believe for all of us we should all have influences that moves us forward, not influences that keep us in the past. So there's certain things I've let go based upon his teachings and certain things I hold on to based upon his teachings. So I just believe we all should make strategic decisions that will help us, um, you know, elevate forward. Did his death lead to um, see any sequence of events? Um, they found out that some police officers was involved. What? Yeah, so two prominent police officers from Brixton, two black guys. Most people know who those black guys are. They got moved from, from um, Brixton police. And uh, I think they was investigated and they found out that they, they, they had something to do with it. So there was quite a lot of different um, set of people that had to do with his death. So I knew that once again, when you're playing a game of chess, you've got to know the next three or four moves, what's going to happen in return. So when you've got police and different different um, entities involved in something that's such a high, high profile. Like they put our names in the newspapers. So our case was one of the first cases um, where they said, based upon him dying, his brothers are now going to come and take over the so-called empire. That's what I was going to ask. Were you fearful they were going to come for you? Not once again, you don't think like that. You mm. don't think like that. Your brain doesn't... Your, when you're in a certain world, your brain doesn't... Well, I can't speak for everyone. But your brain doesn't work like that. You, you don't have headspace for that. You know, um, you are what you are. Your early years will define the way that you think and behave moving forward. So if you're a good boy in your early years, you're not really programmed to be a certain way when you're older. You know, it's like Mike Tyson's always going to be Mike Tyson mm. because he was programmed that way. And so when you look at a lot of the people that's in the mafia, they end up informing in the later years because in the early years, they weren't programmed that way. They became a part of something that they they were they were intrinsically, and so most people who turn into something else down the line is because they weren't built like that originally. So I was built a certain way originally. I was prepped, trained, and also I was taught about self. So, for example, you know what was one of the first lessons I remember? We are all energy. Kev, you don't die; you just transform. So I've never been fearful of dying. I'm just going to transform. People that are scared of dying can be threatened with many different things. People that are scared of being locked away can be threatened with many different things. So I've learned to spend time by myself. I've learned to meditate. I've learned to do all those kind of things. So I've made peace with most things. I've made peace with dying. I've made peace with being by myself. I've made peace with not being in a relationship. I've made peace with all of that. So the simple fact that I've made peace with many different things, I can't be threatened by many different things. <laughs> <laughs> and and in my in my later years, I've made peace that I'm gonna be critic I'm gonna be criticized, I'm gonna be ostracized, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be all these different things. So I've made peace with that. So now I'm not fearful of making certain decisions. It just is what it is. Wow. Mm. I like what I'm hearing. Yeah. <laughs> what was the other brother's reaction back then? And how many brothers are we talking? Um, so I've got Two older brothers. One's just died recently, so Mikey, rest in peace. Um, oh dear, how did he die? Um, a, ble a bleed on the brain. <sighs> yeah, so it's, so it's so sad. It's sad. Oh, that's really sad. Sorry. Um, so 
I tend to not... Um, people can control you by their emotions. So I tend not to listen to people's emotions until they become logical. So when people are emotional, they will tend to express themselves in ways that I don't normally listen to. Because, for example, if I love you and you start crying, your tears can make me start making emotional decisions. And so most people are in jail or in dead right now because of their emotional decisions. So for me, um, just looking around at the emotions that was going on at the time when my brother died, in general, I chose not to intake it because it would have blurred my view of the decisions I needed to make. Mm. But did your brothers adopt that same... No, we're all very different. So what was their reaction then to the death? I think like just like most things, like they were angry. That's natural for everyone that dies. You're angry, you're frustrated, you want justice, whatever justice may look like to you. Um you 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 want you want you want a remedy. But most of the times the remedy first and foremost is that you want your person back. Mm. Mm. You know, that's yeah. the remedy you want, which is impossible. It's not gonna happen. And so you want remedy. And so people seek remedy in all different ways. Memories, usually. Yeah, in all different ways. Hmm. Were things relatively calm in your life after the death of Andy? No, no. My, my life has never been calm because I don't allow my life to be calm. Chaos? I don't. Um, I think you have chaos, then you have organized chaos. I think my life at the moment is organized chaos. But chaos, chaos normally means you have no control. Organized chaos means you have it under control, but it's still a lot of craziness going on. And so for me, um, when you're for something, you're against something. So even when I'm helping people, I'm against another. So even if I'm helping an MP at this precise time, by default, you're against another MP, which they will declare war on you. So I've had all different campaigns come up against me over um, the last five, 10 years. And so you, let me explain how things work. Um, in any campaign, if it's a government campaign or other, anyone that's got some form of level of in intelligence, the first stage of a campaign is, is going to always be to destroy your name. Because once they destroy your name, they can then justify what they're going to do next. So destruction of character and personality is going to be the first stage. And so I've had government bodies try to destroy my name for a period of time. And I'll tell you the reason why. Um, when you come from Brixton, Stoke Park Estate, you come from an environment where people don't play. And then one day you end up in the House of Parliament talking about certain things, you know, um, helping people and all the rest of it. It's a problem. When you end up on RTTV and those news networks and you talk about and you represent certain things, it's a problem. And so I was told by a very powerful aristocrat who said to me, Kevin, Right, let me go back in the story. So um, I was in Abu Dhabi with um, Nicholas Sarkozy just before he was out, um, just before the criminal um, cases got put against him. So Nicholas Sarkozy is the ex-French president. And I was also there with David Cameron. Wow. And so we was in a room, there was probably about, about 30, 40 people in the room. And so anytime you're in a room in such small capacity, what happens, you have like secret services called asking questions. So they'll say like, where are you from? What's your name? And all the rest of it. And sometimes they ask a bit more questions. So as we started to have the conversation, they said, well, Kevin, what's your ambitions moving forward in the future? And I made a, a bit of a mistake there. Um, I said, I don't want to be a world leader. And they laughed. I said, but I'd like to be an advisor to world leaders. Now, I should have never said that. I let too much of my cards out at once. So Secret Service has done some research on me and they was like, hell no, you're going to. So then what happened is I came back. This was going back, I think, 90. This was about five, six years ago. So when I came back, this aristocrat woman said, Kev, I heard about you in Abu Dhabi and I'm letting you know now they're going to do a campaign against you. And I said, you're joking. I said, what do you mean by campaign? She said, she's not quite sure, but a campaign's going to come up against you. And I was like, okay. So I kind of got on with life and I didn't know what that meant. The next minute, this campaign comes out. Kevin's a scammer. And I'm like, what? Hmm? So Kevin's a scammer, Kevin's a scammer. But it's like, but what they do, they always use your community to go against you. 
always. Yeah. They don't use the external community to go against you because it doesn't make technical sense. That's why if you look at Pretty Patel now, the decision she's making against black and brown people is because it, if Boris Johnson done it himself, it would be a problem. But he used Pretty Patel to you to 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 put certain things forward against black and brown people. So there's so much problems happening now. So going back to it, my own community, people that I was helping. Kevin's this, Kevin's that, Kevin's... And I was like, wow. So I was like, Kev, be, chess play this, mm. patience. Let it ride out. So I let it ride out. And then a year later, another one. Yeah? And so they, they kept on throwing different campaigns at me. Kevin's gay. Kevin's a rapist. Kevin's this. So I was just like, okay, if I'm a rapist, if I'm gay, bring the evidence. Send me to prison. Yeah. Because that's so far from the truth. What was your position at this point? In what sense? Like your job title. I was working with government bodies. Yeah. I was working with, so me being a mental and emotional strategist. Yeah. So I'm working with governments, I'm working with organisations, I'm, I'm doing lectures in university, South Bank University, Leeds University, Manchester University. So I'm climbing up the ranks, but they didn't want me to climb up the ranks from that perspective. I should be in jail. I should be in prison. I'm from Stoker Park Estate. What are you doing here? And so all these different campaigns were coming out against me. All these different... Then you had like guys from back in the days who could even come close to you saying to you, come, let's go to war and doing all the YouTube stuff and all the rest of it. And I was like, no, 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 no. Emotional people are not smart and smart people are not emotional. So I never got emotional. I just sat back and I just bided my time and I'm still here. Let the wind blow over on the accusations yeah, thrown well, at you. Well, exactly, because you, you see, here's the thing, right? The, the more powerful you become, the more responsible you must be. And so you have to have a level of discipline. And the test that comes for you in life is never the test that you want. It's the test that you, so you absolutely despise. So I didn't want to be disciplined at times. But that was a lesson and a test that I needed to overcome, was a level of discipline. And so discipline has, has helped me to this stage. So at one point in, in your life, you're going to need patience. At another point, you're going to need discipline. At another point, you're going to need to know how to present yourself from a legalese perspective. From another point, you need to understand what slang and how you navigate in that world. And so there's disciplines in all different type of ways from behavior, mindset, um, your, your, the food you eat and so on and so forth, or you end up in trouble. That totally resonates because once I started to do certain videos that I'm not allowed to talk about, mm -mm. the campaigns began against me. Mm. They said I'd done GoFundMe scams. Yep. They said I was gay. So you Every, understand it, right? You understand you, everything it. Everything you said. Exactly, because that's what they do. And they, they disrupt your community and, and turn their heads. So you know exactly yeah, what, what I'm saying. That's how they do and it. And there's normally free campaigns they use against you. It's like, it's, it's so boring. Like, mm. it's the same free campaigns. Either, well, it's four campaigns. Either you're, mm -hmm. you're gay, you're a rapist, or you're a scammer. They're the four yeah. that just keeps on rotating. Yeah. And that's what they do. If you look at, like, for example, campaigns against um, uh, Saddam Hussein. Right, fair enough. Saddam Hussein was a bit of a nightmare. But if you look at, <laughs> you know, if you look at Saddam Hussein <sighs> and all the rest of, like, um, the different... Um, tyrants or whatever you want to call them or maybe they're freedom fighters who knows mm. down to personal opinion but the campaigns are normally around four or five genocide or this or that it's always pretty much the same and so you know when the level of intelligence of campaign comes to you based upon what the campaign is mm. and do you, you know where it's coming from do you think females get it as hard then because to be accused of them four things is quite difficult for a female on some of them no fe females fem females aren't Females are not really, um, if, the, if there's a campaign against a female, it's more local and it's, a, it's slightly more petty. But when it comes to a man, it's, it's a lot more ruthless, it's a lot more hard. Women, it's normally like slag shaming, slut shaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. But once again, like, you know, you play the game right. Look at the Kardashians. Look how they started off and look where they ended up. You know, so no matter how much you kind of throw at females sometimes, if they know how to use it in their favour. But uh, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of females that are suffering in silence. Yes. You know, maybe they did do something wrong and now they're living with that shame and they may be suicidal. But the, the problem is 
the, the stories of the ones who has failed are the stories you won't hear because they've, di they've died, they've committed suicide or they're, they're in a dark place. So sometimes it's more the celebratory stories you hear about more than the stories that it's just faded away because the person killed themselves. They can't handle being such shamed or being told that they're gay or being told that whatever it may be. Because if I was another person, maybe I would have committed suicide. Because it's not a nice thing being accused for things you know you're absolutely not. It's not nice. So you have to have such a level of understanding self. We I mean, look at that case of Caroline Flack last year. Yeah, exactly. That was horrendous. Exactly. Being exactly. accused of violence she didn't commit, well, allegedly. Yeah. And, so. and look now, she's gone now and she, did not, did, did, she, did, she doesn't have another chance at life again. No. Going back to your story then, so you said in the years after Andy's death, it wasn't easy. What was the first challenge? Protecting the ones closer to you. You step up security, you step up discipline, but most importantly, you start looking at who's friends and who's foe. There's always going to be someone that's close to you that's a part of your deception, part of the death, part of certain things. So I had to, I had to sit down and rebuild everything again. I didn't want most people around me. So, for example, I was told, you can have everything now, you know. Andy's gone, you can take over. And I totally refused. I totally refused because we have infiltrators around us and we have people who are working with all different parts of either government or the other side. And so, once again, I learned from a very young age that every single network has a minimum of two to three police informants around them, uh, within it. It's a fact. It's an actual fact. It's a police fact. And so, once again, who are those people? Who are the people that you that envy you? Who you've you've got to do a, a total cleanse. You've got to detox your whole environment. You've got to detox your world. And a personality assassin assassination. Like on these people? No, How no, no, that, this is two different things. So what happens is, because as you said, like, wh what was the next steps after mm. my brother died? Um, he gets rid of everybody. You, yeah, you, you, yeah, you yeah. have to you have to get rid of everything. And then- you don't, a, you don't try and judge it and see what's what. You just get rid of them all. Total clear out. You clear everything out and then you, it's a bit like your house, right? You want to give your house the best clean ever. Take all the sofas out and then put back in what you need. And that's what you do. You take everything out and then you put it all back together bit by bit. I mean, you even see it if you watch films like The Godfather, when his father was infiltrated and they find out it was Fredo, and we all have a Fredo in our lives. <laughs> 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 we all have a Fredo in our lives. And um, once again, he knew only one person he could trust. Everyone else that said, we're brothers, I love you, we're this, we're that, all the rest of it, he could not trust anyone. And the ones that he thought was the problem, they were the ones that were still rooting for him. And he finds out that his brother was a part of almost him getting killed. And before, when his father got shot up, etc., is once again, his, his brother was weak. And his brother wasn't doing what his brother needed to do. And so sometimes in life, right, we, we, we want to believe in the people beside us because we grew up with them and we've gone through trials and tribulations with them and all the rest of it. But the truth be told, is anytime something goes wrong, you clean everything up and you restack and rebuild again, or it's going to end up in your demise. How do we know that? We know that because most crews, you, you, you've got more research and understanding than I do when it comes to different crews and crime networks and all the rest of it, that nine times out of 10, it was the people around them or someone who weren't doing their job properly that caused the demise of everything. Or snitches. They either snitch or they weren't doing their job properly. In, in my organisation, it was my... Top ecstasy salesperson fell out with my chief, uh, my best friend and bodyguard, Wild Man. Mm -hmm. And the ecstasy guy got so scared of Wild Man, there's this, this ongoing feud, and then that guy went to the police and turned us all there in. There you go. And yeah. I bet you had signs that something was wrong, but you just, at the time, you just let it slide, right? Yeah. Well, he right. wasn't doing it a year, so he probably thought he got away with it, surely. Hmm? Because you'd stopped doing it a year before, did you think you got away with it? That's the other thing as well. I did stop the yeah. importation, but I was naive to the statute of limitations. They don't have to catch you with the drugs. <laughs> Just take someone from the last seven years in Arizona, the last seven years for a drug crime to say they did a drug transaction with you, mm -hmm. and then they've got a case. It's mm -hmm. a statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
So that's what happens. You're strong as your weakest link. We all yeah. know that. But when it's been exercised, that's when it's painful. Because that hurt you the most, the fact that you walked away, right? Yeah, it did. I, I <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, in, the beginning, I, in the beginning, I resented it. <laughs> yeah. But then I realized I've done all this. I have to take responsibility and accept my karma cheerfully. Yeah, exactly. I just try to make the most of it. And, exactly. And, well, it's and, like a turning and, point and, in the brain, and, and, isn't and, it? And, and now look what you got from it, yeah? <laughs> Swings and roundabouts. <laughs> so, all right, so going back to your story then, how, how did you rebuild once you'd cleaned house? Okay, so once I cleaned house, right, I changed the way how I start to look at life and the way I think. So everything to me is frequency. And it sounds very, you know, woo. Yeah? <laughs> so that sounds David Icke. But, but, but everything is frequency. And let me break it down. Um, everything on this planet is made out of atoms everything you me our clothes this table cameras lights everything is made out of atoms so i believe that when god talks about made people from their from his image the image only can be atoms that's the only common denominator that we all have is atoms okay now inside of an atom what's inside of an atom you've got protons photons quarks electrons and so on and so forth when you're in a proton state you're in a positive state Okay, so proton, you build positive people around you. When you're in an electron state, you're in a negative state. Negativity happens around you. When you're in a neutron state, it's like a dimmer switch. You can sway either way. So the first thing I had to do is ask myself, what frequency am I vibrating at? And I realized I was in an electron state. And I was like, there you go. That's your problem first and foremost, Kevin. Work on changing your vibrational frequency. So I started to change my vibrational frequency and I started to understand more about energy. And that energy is connected to feelings. And feelings, sorry, stages. Energy is connected to free feelings. Sorry, energy is connected to emotions. Emotions are connected to feelings. Emotions and feelings are two different things. They believe People believe it's the same. So what happened when... Um, I looked at my vibrational frequency, I was vibrating at a low frequency. Now, what's a low, a, a, a low electron frequency? Doubt, worry, anger, jealousy, depression, uh, pessimism, and so on and so forth. So I was, I was anger, rage. I was vibrating at a low vi vibrational frequency. So everything that was happening around me, it, that's what was happening. So I said, right, I need to move from an electron frequency to a proton frequency. So I had to now start looking at hope, optimism, love, joy, romance, understanding. So I started to adjust the way that I had a relationship with the world. Did it go electron and then you had to spend time on the neutron before you went to the proton? No, just, no, that's actually a very good question. Yeah. See, here's the thing. It depends where you are. So some people, their house, their emotional house may be an electron house. So feelings, I can have a feeling right now. I, I can feel I can feel romance and then I get a, a phone call and I heard something bad. Now I feel now I feel unhappy. So feelings can move up and down the scales very quickly. Emotions is where you tend to live a bit longer. Mm. And so my emotions I had to work on and that took a bit more time but your feelings you you can sway up and down you know you're horny one minute and life is so great and you're you're in a place of that and then you get a phone call and so it says guess what your friend from school just died you're not horny anymore whatever's just standing <laughs> up has fallen back down yeah. so what is what so feelings are something that go up and down based upon what's happening within your day emotions is where you live. You tend to go back to that as your default setting because that's where you've been living for such a long period of time that you, it's like, for example, someone who's depressed, okay? If someone um, has what you call developmental trauma, developmental trauma is what happens to you like neglect or whatever within the first six years of your life. So you tend to feel neglected throughout your life. That's the house that you live in. You know, straight away you meet someone and then you're like, I really love this person, but are they going to leave me like my mother left me? Are they going to leave me like how my father That's left me? That's when the doubt creeps in. And then all of a sudden your relationship starts to fall apart because your emotional house is developmental trauma. And so most people that may go through depression, there's nine different types of depression from bi bi bipolar as a depression to manic depression to 
clinical depression, there's all different types of depression. So when people are living in a certain frequency, that takes a bit more time. Now, thank God, I had enough in my energy bucket for me to move away from it a lot quicker. But what happens when you move away from your frequency of negativity to positivity, I always say, when you're the light, the moths come in. Oh, yeah. And so the moths are the <laughs> ones that hate you for it because you're the light. And so the moths may be your old friends that were negative. Then they declare war on you because you're moving away. Your loved ones sometimes declare war on you because you're moving away from that frequency. So you become the enemy because your frequencies change from a negative one to a positive one. Hence me always say, I'm always in war. The war is a frequency war. I used to find that losing friends when, like in the past couple of years, I've got rid of a few. It's like having a nice good clear out because they're mm. negative, like bastards really. Well, do you know what? I honestly believe that like, you should have an MOT checkup on your friends every four years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people, some people, you know, they were good for you when you when you were, you know, when you were 25, but they're not good for you when you're no. 35, but you keep them around you because of those other years mm. and they end up being a part of your pain. So mm. I believe that you should have an MOT check when it comes to your friends every four years or so and have a clear out if need be. What's the checklist? Do you know what? Everyone's different, but the checklist more than anything is, do they make me feel bad? Do they keep me in a dark place? And do they elevate me when I need to be elevated? And do they celebrate me when I'm winning? Mm. And that's what should be the rules for all of us, regardless what our world is in. Definitely. Did your other family members celebrate you when you started resonating at this light frequency then? 50-50. 50-50. Really? Yeah. And how did you handle the other 50? 33.3% of people are going to love you no matter what you do. 33.3% of people is going to hate you no matter what you do. And 33.3% of people are not sure. What about the 0000.0001 zero, 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 They just fall between, that's falling between the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> but the 33.3% but the, but the, the, the of people who's not sure, they're the ones you win over. And the 33.3% 33 who celebrate you, they're the ones you celebrate in return. Mm. And if it's your family, it's got to hurt if they're not with you. No, because here's the thing. Your, 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 see, here's the thing. Your family, because your family through blood, you know, because you 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 come from the same parent or because you come from the same tree, it doesn't mean that that person should love you. And it doesn't mean that you should expect love from them. It doesn't, it, see, it works in Disney World that way. But when you come out of the munchkins dancing on the yellow brick road, the reality is no, none of our families are exempt from that family or those set of family members who despise you and those family members who just love you no matter what. None of us are exempt from it. So long as that we, res we, we, um, respect that reality it's, it's fine but if we start to commit to what doesn't exist we cause ourselves pain but you talked about cleaning house you can't clean house can you for your family because you've got to deal with them constantly no why well aren't you usually like in the doing this in the same social you know it's a birthday no. this the... no no so what about birthday parties i'm just inquiring you know <laughs> Someone i love my family so, i promise so, so, um, so, <laughs> All right, we'll talk about that later. So, Who was it? Right, you get invited to a party. Yeah. A member's there who's in the lower 33.3%. Yeah. What do you do? Do you go to the party or do you not go? Or do it you depends. go there it depends. ignore them? It, no, it depends if they're a pain or problem to you. If you believe... Remember Fredo. Let's go back to Fredo so we can yeah. keep it simple. Yeah? Fredo knew where Michael was. So Fredo let the enemies know where Michael was sleeping. So it depends on how bad that family member is. If that family member is the family member that will cause you so much pain and problems, don't go. It's not worth it. If the family is just like, you're an idiot and I'm going to put you in a nice little box with a bow in it called idiot, then you can go. <laughs> There's other families you won't deal with, but you'll be very cordial and you'll smile and you will nod and you'll keep your distance. It really depends on the severity of how dangerous that family member is. But I can tell you this for a fact. Any family member that you give I'm going to go back on that. Let me just go back and I explain it. I'm not a fan of titles. I think titles are extremely dangerous. Okay. So I'm going to be mindful about your channel. So how I explain my point. Titles are one of the main reasons why children are endangered. Are one of the main reasons why um, people get hurt and killed. And one of the main reasons why you will always be blindsided. So for example, what about those parents who handed those children over to a priest? Mm. 
Yeah. Right? Did they look at the priest's character or did they look at the title? How many times did police abuse their power? Did you look at the policeman's character or did you look at the fact that he was a police officer? Titles are dangerous because it allows you not to do your due diligence. So anytime a title comes before your true character, uh, the character of the person, you're always putting yourself in danger. So when I look at family members, I don't say cousin, auntie, brother, sister, whatever it may be. I say character first and energy first, not titles. So my title being the co-host. <laughs> yeah, he's not in any danger yet. yet. <laughs> but, but see, the thing is, right, here's the difference. The difference is this. And they, they looked at this with, with uh, people that's got autism, for example. Right. People that are autistic, right, they tend to have uh, pay more due diligence to their world because they know they're autistic. People who are not autistic, for example, they don't pay as much due diligence to the world because to them, everything's easy. And so the difference with Sean, I would imagine, is Sean done his due diligence on you because you're not family. Mm. That's because you're not family. He would have done less due diligence on you if you were family and if you were bad for him. Ah. So that's the difference. When you have um, a point to research because you don't know the person or you're not you're not well equipped within that sector, you tend to do more due diligence, which then allows you to be to protect yourself. But for example, let's go back to the road. It's one of the man the minute. That's that is a qualification. One the man the minute. Oh, we come from the same estate. They're titles. They're not looking at the character of the person. So what happens to one the man them? He ends up becoming your problem. Most people, what I see, come from road, right? I see friendships form like this. I kid you not. And I may be the only person, but I'm just telling you what I've observed. Bro, you got any weed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got any cigarette? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you got Rizzler? You got Rizzler? All right, cool. Just bill up. That's their friend. They've just now formed a friendship. Mm. Just like when women will say, all right, they're in the bathroom together. Hi, you're all right. You're, you know, Toilet friends, we call them. Exactly. Yeah. All of a sudden, unlike men, women will tell them their whole life story. Oh, then yeah. your enemies a week later... And then they know your whole life story and they're telling you the reason why you're a hoe. Like, oh. and you're like I, I, I told you, I told you in true confidence that, you know, uh, I slept with four guys at night and now you're telling everyone, well, why did you tell her that? Because the environment felt good to you, but you didn't do your due diligence on her. You didn't do your research. A lot of guys become friends because of weed billing up or become, become friends because it's one demand a minute. Mm. Not enough due diligence. And this is the reason why a lot of times it ends in tears. Mm. So after you cleaned house and moved to the light, what was your next challenge? Convincing the world that I'm genuine, but convincing myself that I'm genuine. Because when you're used to one thing and then you move over, you have a lot of self conversations. And so, you know, People tend to ask you very in their own ways, are you qualified? When you're writing the book, what qualified you? Yeah, because you're like you're doing a book signing somewhere and then they come up to you, people come up to you and say, and they look at you and they say, Did you write that yourself? Yeah. Did you self publish <laughs> that? <laughs> and then, oh actually I'm with, you know, so and so. It took me so many years to write. Um, but they just they judge prejudge you. People are always pre you. Yeah, prejudging. Yeah, yeah. People are always trying to qualify you. I'm always being pre pre qualified. You know, who do you think you are to talk about psychology? Like you're you're a mental and emotional strategist. What qualifies you? Well, the simple fact that I just changed you from depression to happy over the last six weeks, that qualifies mm. me for a start. The fact that I've been in that dark place and I've been in the light place and I've created tools over the years, that qualifies me. The simple fact that I've had nearly 100,000 people globally that I've helped directly and indirectly, that qualifies me. The fact that I've studied every single book to, that I can possibly get my hands on, yeah, to to learn about um, neural science and how the brain works and how emotions are work, that qualifies me. So you know you have to spend time making sure that you qualify within yourself, and then you spend a bit more time justifying that qualification amongst certain other people. So how do I justify my qualification as a co-host? 
to Sean Atwood. I've had a lot of uh You've just been a natural since day one and the oh, responses have there been you go. very There you go. Instagram following up four hundred percent. <laughs> yes, because I walked in. No, I wrote a book. I've got no journalism experience. It doesn't and, matter. It and doesn't matter. Just all gonna chat in. <laughs> all our paths and all our journeys are different. Yeah. If we were all built the same, we'd all be boring. So it's fine. It's fine to be different. It's fine to be an outlier. It's fine. It's mm. perfectly fine. Just be true to yourself. That's the only one qualification you need is to be honest and true to yourself. Don't be a liar to yourself. It's a painful, lonely life. Amen to that. Mm. Mm. So you said one of your, your qualifications was the dark places that you had been. What dark places were those? You know, I think we all go through depression. You know, some of us live there and some of us stay there for a short period of time. I've been through trauma. I've been through traumatic experiences. Um, we've gone through pain. I've seen some of my loved ones die. You know, I had a nephew that committed suicide at the age of 11 years old. Ooh. I've had school friends die. I've had school friends kill themselves. I've had school friends being killed. You know, when, when you live in the darks for such a long period of time, you, you kind of forget that there's a light. You forget there's a light. And so I've done a lecture um, at um, South, uh, uh, I think it was South Bank University. I can't remember. Don't quote me on that. I done a lecture at a university, and there was a white woman, um, very posh, very well to do, and she was lecturing to a whole group of black guys, and she was saying to them why they should be positive, and they found it offensive. How dare you tell us how to be positive when you clearly look like you're living good? So I was going to be the next speaker on and I said to her, I'd love to do an experiment with you, but I'm asking for full permission. Do you mind if I do it? And she says, yes. I said, okay, it's fine. So I started doing my lecture after her, my talk after her. And I said, right, are you ready? She says, yeah. So I, I, I got a bucket of, it was like a, they had some big bowls of water. And I said, I'm going to do something with you. Just give me permission and you're going to understand everything what these people in this room is going through. So if you want to risk it for that, then let's do it. She said, okay, I'm going to risk it. I said, okay. So I said, I want you to think as positive as you can. Extremely positive. I mean, put all your feng shui in the pot here. Everything, yeah? <laughs> I want you to put all of your positivity in the pot. She said, okay. So she started to think positive. I gave her five minutes or so. And then I said, right, now I'm going to just gently push your head in this water. So as I push her head in the water, after about eight seconds, she started to like splash a bit. And I thought, no, no, I'll give her three more seconds. And I gave her about three or four more seconds. And then she said, oh, she came up. And I said, tell me what you was thinking about in that moment. She says, I just wanted to be alive. I said, now you know what these people are going through. No matter how positive you try to be sometimes, when you're drowning, you're drowning. Mm. And so that's what it's about. The stage one is stop yourself from drowning. And stage two is understand how to swim. Stage three is walk on the beach. Stage four is buy a house on the beach. So this stage is, <laughs> yeah, but you can't buy a house on the beach when you're drowning. No. So, so you have to get away from drowning first. And most of us out here are drowning. And it's, it's offensive when people say, be positive when you're drowning. Mm. So we have to teach and we have to help people from not be drowning first, teach them how to swim, get them on the beach, then buy the beach house. Wise words. Wow. All right, let's get this straight then. So you clear house and then you, you, you've got a mental challenge then. You go into meditation and, and yeah. introspection. Yeah, I started to learn about spirituality. Wow. I, I learned about all different different things overall. And um, yeah, I started to build myself up bit by bit. It's a lonely journey. It's a very, very lonely journey. And most people that goes on this path, it's a, it's a lonely journey. You know, you're going through pain, you're dealing with your traumas, you're dealing with your stresses, you're dealing with so many different things. People sometimes, see, when you make certain decisions to grow, you will come across to others that you're probably going mad. So I'll give you a prime example. I got rid of, at one point, my cars, my houses and everything. People thought I was going mad. But what I tell you what I learned in that process, I remember I, I had a house, well, I can say it now, the house is gone. Um, I had I had a house in Norwood, a beautiful house in Norwood. I had all these different things and it was nice. 
And when I got rid of those things, my cars, my house, my jewelry, the whole shebang, people's like, why are you getting rid of these things? And I was giving a lot of the stuff away. They thought I was going through a, a breakdown of some type. And I wasn't. I tell you what I understood. Imagine trying to build a cake and you don't know the ingredients to a cake. But you're making a cake. So you're putting chicken in the cake. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're putting chicken in the cake and you, you put some bread in the cake and you put all these things in the cake and then one day you get to a place where you realise these are all the wrong ingredients but it's now it's time to put icing on the cake and so what do you do? Do you put icing on the cake or do you scrap the cake and start again? Scrap the cake. Some people put icing on it. Some people scrap the cake. So they end up with a load of shit is what you're saying. So clear. Well, we'll get to the shit part in a second. <laughs> yeah. But that's what happens. A lot. So there's a lot of people that's wearing jewellery as the icing in. They're driving nice cars. That's the icing in. Their breasts is done. Their bum's done. Their this is done. That's all the icing in. But the cake was built incorrectly. The wrong ingredients. And so they walk around traumatised on the inside and broken on the inside and the outside of them looks so beautiful because icing always looks good and everyone wants to taste icing. But inside, the cake is built incorrectly. So I actually scrap the whole cake and start again. So everything about me right now, I can say is authentically me. I know the ingredients to my cake. I know what I should be, how I should be, what I represent. When people try to embarrass me, I know how to maintain that level of discipline. When people try to chastise me or oust me, I know, put me in the corner, I'll be fine. But you can't do that when you are in a place of incorrect ingredients. You, it can't be done. Well, I think the similar thing happened to you when you got arrested, you lost your house, your car, your girlfriend, your fucking everything got stripped Yeah, back. but that was forced upon me, wasn't it? <laughs> you didn't want that. <laughs> I, I wasn't the chef on that occasion. <laughs> <laughs> but it was built on shit, nevertheless. It wasn't the correct cake. Yeah, the cake so, had to be annihilated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And sometimes the cake is, is, is being smashed down for you and some of it, sometimes yeah. you, can, you can do it yourself. And back to the shit part, as we were talking about, <laughs> let, let's talk a bit about the shit. So when we were born, we were precious diamonds when we were born, right? Beautiful, precious diamond. You know, your family sees, you, your, your parents see, everyone sees you in this beautiful diamond and they love you. And you're so bright and you're beautiful and all the rest of it. And then one day when probably you're about six or seven, shit creeps into your, to your life. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're too fat. You're too thin. You know, look at your teeth. They're wonky. Whatever it may be, you're not good enough. The diamond is who you are. The shit is who you think you are. <laughs> and so all, because you've got so much shit on your mind, you now start to put sprinkles all over you, which is the cars and the jewelries and the cute stuff and the clothes and all the rest of it. So all of a sudden, you're the diamond deep down, but you've stopped remembering that you're the diamond because you're the shit. And it ain't good shit either, yeah? <laughs> And so you're using sprinkles in order to cover the shit because of your self-conversation. And so what do we do? We spend most of our life right after that trying to get back to the diamond. Because once you get, get back to the diamond, the diamond shines brighter than the sprinkles. So your advice is to clear everything out clear of valuable, out. apart from your sentimental shit. I did do that actually last year. Got rid of the car, the... Mm -hmm. The bloke, the house, the, you know, money and all that. Wow. And I was honestly staying in a service apartment so I found my new place. Mm -hmm. And all I had was a fucking suitcase. All my stuff, like my clothes and stuff were in storage. Mm -hmm. I turned around to my friend. I said, all these years, I had a walk-in wardrobe in my old house. I thought, all these fucking years. And I don't need any of it. Exactly. I felt so free. Mm. Exactly. So yeah, clear the shit. Do, do you, do, there you go. <laughs> I still got shit. a lot of stuff now, but yeah. And, and, just... and, and that's interesting because do you know that people like Mark Zuckerberg and a lot of these very successful people, they have very simple wardrobes because they ain't got time spending too Capsule much time. Capsule wardrobes, they're good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, have very, like, yeah. they wear black t-shirt, black jacket, whatever. Like, but black do jeans. they wear a Boomer and Jen hoodie in sage green available? <laughs> 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 Link in the description box. <laughs> brilliant. I love it. They thank should. You, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. But yeah, Mark Zuckerberg, he's simple, you were saying. Most of them are simple. Most extremely 
clear-minded, successful people keep simplicity as the key to their happiness and simplicity to the key to their success. Anything that's complicated makes you unhappy and anything that's complicated stops you from being successful. If you want success, keep your life simple. Good advice. So, so did you detach then from the material world at some point when you went through that phase of yes. selling your houses and properties yes. and stuff like that. And it was painful. And I didn't realise how much it controlled me because I had my Rolex watch. I had my Rolex, I had my diamond chains. I had all of those kind of things. And I kid you not, when I took those off and when I stopped driving certain cars, I kid you not, I felt naked. I felt like I couldn't talk to a woman. I didn't realise how much it had control over me because your, your accessories become your personality after a period of time. And so what happened when my accessories became my personality, I stopped losing who I was and I didn't even realize it. Wow. And so it took a bit of time for me to discover me again. And once I discovered me, I can wear my jewelry now. You know, I've got jewelry on right now. I can yeah. wear my jewelry now, but I don't, it doesn't define me. It doesn't define me. I, I don't care for it. Um, and I can't be controlled by it. And every decision I make in my life moving forward now I make decisions based upon my happiness, my purpose on this planet, and how I can serve others. The key to success is servitude. And so if you look at your channel, what gives you power? What gives you happiness? What gives you purpose is servitude. Servitude is the key. Look at the most successful companies on the planet. Google, servitude. Facebook, servitude. Jesus, servitude. Servitude, servitude, servitude. Mm. Mohammed, servitude. You know, like servitude is the key to success but understanding self is the key to self-success and also so, gratitude well gratitude once again would always be um, linked to simplicity mm. because you're grateful for your world you're grateful for you you're grateful for all those kind of things so your gratitude will be connected to simplicity you can't be grateful when your world is complicated because mm. you don't recognize it so once you've gone through the pain barrier of detachment then, was there a sense of liberation from the material? 100%. How did that feel? It felt like I started to discover who I was. Mm. And then you start to find new personalities within yourself. You, you start to realise that, hold on a second, I kid you not when I said the, say, say this to you, I didn't realise that the wind used to blow through the leaves. That like small things, you'll be driving down the road and police is driving behind you, you just don't care. Like you're not in paranoid mode, you know. You you walk on the beach and your feet sinks into the sand. And what I'm trying to say to you is, when your life is traumatic or traumatised, you stop being sensitive to the nice things in life. It's like when I, I've never been to prison before, but when I talk to my friends, um, they say to me like, Kev, when I came out of prison and I tasted, like just had my mum's dinner, it was the greatest thing ever. Or the fact that I can just be a part of the sun. Mm. Or, you know, because when something's taken away from you, you realise how pressure it is, precious it is to you. But when you take it away from yourself, that means you're in your own prison in your mind. When you let yourself out of that prison, only then you realise how amazing this world is. Wow. And, we're, and from that moment onwards, did things go smoothly? Or did things will never go smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> things will never go smoothly. Yeah. Like, it's a myth. <laughs> but anywhere there's ambition, there's going to be problems. Definitely. That's first and foremost. Yeah. Your, your ambition um, causes problems. Ambition alone will cause you to have stress and anxiety. In what sense? Well, okay, so I spend uh, a, a bit of my, my time now in Tenerife. And what I've discovered about certain parts of Spain is they're not very ambitious. Now, not in a bad way, may I add. They, like, for example, Tenerife is very simple. So, you know, they don't really, a lot of the children don't go to university, not because they don't want to be well educated, it's because they don't need more lawyers on the small island. They don't need certain things. So they keep their life very simple. They, they would work, you know, in a nice basic store. The government will subsidize them for the, the, the months that the tourism trade has gone down. And they go on the beach. They spend time with the family on the beach. They go to work, do four or five hours. They don't work one second afterwards. They go back on the beach again. And when you see these people, they live long and they're happy because their lives are very simple. Why is it that we're in one of the most, 
richest countries in the world, but our depression rate is so high, our suicide rate is so high, and we're just not happy. That everything's grey when it comes to England for ma for majority of people. And if you look at the common denominators, what makes everything grey is the fact that we're always in competition with our with people. We want more. We're tr we're trying to do more. We're trying to be smarter than yesterday. We're trying to be all these different things. But no matter how smart and, and how much we're striving and how much we're pushing, we're becoming more un unhappy. Our families are broken. Our children are confused. We don't have enough time to even enjoy. Well, I was going to say the weather. The weather. <laughs> right? the, there's many things we don't have because we're trying to strive for more and it's causing us more pain than pleasure. So we need to find ways to simplify and then maximize because we work numerous hours to pay for a home that we're never in because we're always at work apart from the past two years obviously mm -hmm. um to then drive a you know you pay for a car to drive to and from work to then live that sort of lifestyle so basically everything you earn is going out to go to work to then go home go to sleep get because, up and do the same the thing again majority of people's concept of success is that Mm. is to accumulate as much things as possible. The more things you have, the more successful you'll be. That is the mindset of this um, um, world and environment. And it's, and it's untrue. And we know that because the more we get something, we celebrate it for 35 seconds, then we're back on the grind again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's untrue. Wow. So we need to find ways in order for us to, we need to simplify first and understand what simplicity means. And then stage two, we can accumulate under the rules that we won't be prisoners to it. Me and my friend came up with an idea that we were gonna go, admittedly we were a bit tipsy, that we were gonna go live in a cave in Ch Cheddar Gorge and like fuck society. Mm -hmm. Go off the grid, right? Yeah, get a bit of tarpaulin, little shower, and uh, yeah, just fuck the grid. <laughs> but the funny thing is, how many people um, go camping and actually enjoy camping? Loads. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's simple and the pressure's off. You don't need to check your Instagram every 35 seconds, creating anxiety like someone liked me today. Does someone want to know me tomorrow? <laughs> you know, and all the yeah. rest of it. Like, don't you realize we, we check our phones because we're looking for gratitude. No gratitude right now. Let me put my phone back down. <laughs> 20 minutes later, any, any more gratitude? <laughs> Jesus, no gratitude. Maybe I'm not liked. Maybe I'm not loved. Oh my gosh, let me check her gratitude. <gasps> 942 gratitude likes. How much is my four? Oh my gosh. And and that's the world we're living in. We're trying to accumulate more to find happiness. Wow. So what do I do with the haters? You don't. <laughs> Where your focus goes, your energy flows. Thank you. Where your focus goes, your energy flows. If you focus on how sexy that guy is, your body becomes more moist and relaxed. If you focused on how horrible that woman is, your body becomes more tensed and, and, and anxious. So where your focus goes, your energy flows. Focus on what you love and love will love you in return. Focus on what you hate and hate will come to visit you. Thank God we love podcasting. <laughs> mm. So in more recent years then, Kevin, what have been your biggest challenges? My ambition and watching my parents get older mm. and watching my loved ones die because you can do nothing about it. That causes major pain. My ambition causes me pain. Um, and so I, I am also um, a hypocrite to what I've just said because my, ambitious, my ambitions cause me pain, but my ambitions also cause me purpose. So my ambitions are not fickle things. My ambitions are things to serve and help others but I'm totally out of my comfort zone, which I like, but sometimes it's painful. So at the moment, for example, um, I am I'm started a, uh, something like this and it's helping people that's going through mental and emotional trauma. It's called Kevin Bennett's trauma. And um, it's designed to help people who are going through trauma themselves. Um, and so I do that. And, and because I care, it causes me pain at times. You know, when I'm listening to people going through things, it hurts. So I even had to stop it for a little while because it, it, I, it, I genuinely care. Um, and then I'm building a platform called K Benair, and this platform is helping people 
who are it's a bit like better help if you've ever heard of better help oh we have indeed yeah you do know we did an advert for them yeah oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh in that case do have that for me better though yeah um so it's a bit like better help but it's gonna be better than better help better Ooh. help for those who don't know better help is a platform where um you know you have a therapist and you have people who need, are looking for therapists and they bring them together right match and you know that's the what better helps about where with my one platform it does that but also you can go there and you can get videos that's going to help you with your stress and trauma you can go there and you can get podcasts that will help you with your stress and trauma you can go and um go to results and different places that's going to help you with stress and trauma so everything to do with emotions and lifestyle that's what this platform as is bringing together so it's launching in about a month or two now i've been putting this platform together for the last six seven years getting it wrong spending tens of thousands of pounds stressed out getting it you know it, it, it so i love what i do but it causes me massive pain and i'm writing a book at the moment um called who helps the helpline when the helpline needs help and so it's exactly what it says on the tin so what i discovered since 2009 up until this current time that industries carry frequencies so, for example, most people don't know. It's like, I would love to be a surgeon, for example. Like, that's what people say. Okay, do you know that surgeons have the highest suicide rate? Do you know that dentists and doctors are not too far behind them with high suicide rates? Then you've got, so then you, you've got one set of, one sector where they've got high suicide rates and you've got another sector that's got high depression rates. So, you know, um, police officers, high depression rate. You know, um, military personnel, they actually fit in a suicide and and high high depression rate. Then you've got high stress rates, social workers and so on and so forth. So, you know, industries carry frequencies. Industries carry protons and they're built upon it. Industries carry electrons and they're built upon it. And so for, for, for many working professionals, they're suffering in silence. Now, I'm writing about this in my book at the moment. Um, and what it looks at, especially in America, and I think they're trying to make it better at this precise time. But in America, for example, if a surgeon or an anaesthetist or one of them um, tend to um, show the fact that they're going through depression, which they will and which they do, they can lose their medical license. So what they've been doing is going from state to state using different names to get therapy. And so many people are suffering in silence. Many people in our communities are suffering in silence because, oh my gosh, you suffer from bipolar. Oh my gosh, you suffer from, you know, um, psychotic depression or whatever. And so people suffer in silence because if they share it, they feel pain. And, and people start to oust them and chastise them and laugh at them and all the rest of it. So there's many people out there right now that are suffering in silence. And at the top of the tree are working professionals. And I, and I want to change the narrative of that. Well done. Wow. Wow. And what about Brixton these days? Is it less dangerous? Less dangerous, um, less dangerous, still stressful. Um, so yeah, what what happened in the in the early two thousands, two thousand early two thousands? They said to they said to everyone, listen guys, I tell you what, you move out of Britain, you'll have a better life. So all these people were like, yeah yeah yeah, we want to move out of Britain and have a better life. They're like, all right, let's move to Croydon. And then all these people moved to Croydon. They went, hold on, you're my next door neighbour in Brixton. <laughs> so um. um Brixton may be a better life, but but it doesn't solve the problem that where it moves to. It moves to Croydon, it moves to Thornton Heath, it moves to, you know, different parts of London. So it's like moving people around and the gentrifying doesn't solve the problem. It just moves the problem from one place to another, back to cleaning up again. If you're moving the dust from one part of the house to the other part of the house, you, you, you know, the people that come to visit, you may not see it, but everyone's still going to sneeze from the dust. Mm. Well said. <laughs> Kevin, you're a unique individual. <laughs> Thank you. You're so profound. Mm -hmm. And I just love the way you've told us your life story, but we've done things that are so important to what's going on in society mm -hmm. and pe everyone's going through stuff. And I imagine, you know, the people watching this, if you felt the same as me, uh, it's probably resonated with you on some level as to some aspect of your own life. And I, I appreciate you coming. I've learned Thank so you. much from you. Thank you. And you've been, ab been absolutely gripped the whole time. Um, do you want to let the people know where they can find you and support you? Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a very new channel. So thank you for my one subscriber. <laughs> I'll subscribe no, but, um, to you later. Yeah, so thank <laughs> you. So um, 
my channel's called Kevin Bennett's Trauma. If you look out for that, please. And what I'm going to be doing, because as I said, I was just mourning my brother's death, so I can kind of zone back in now. But I'm, you know, the channel is about helping people that's going through trauma, my sole focus only. And so if people want to reach out to me or people want to talk to me, that's my mission in life. I, I, I choose not to do anything else apart from helping people that's going through trauma. And it ain't just a conversation. I have, I have tools and strategies and stuff that has been helping people since 2009. I'm also my book as well. It'll be coming out soon. And it ain't just talking about working professionals, but it shows you about how to use the planets and the stars as well to help you. So like, like for example, uh, just very quickly, um, people believe there's more than 28 days in a year, uh, in a month. There's not. There's 28 days in a month. And so the, the 28 days is divided into four, which is the first quarter of the moon, the oh, moon phases. Yeah, yeah I'm very into yeah. that. First yeah. qu quarter. Waning. Yep. Waxing. Exactly. So you new. understand it, right. Yeah. And so oh, what happens bitch, at, cer mood. at certain times, yeah, at certain times of the moon, vibrations change. The police has reported it. Ambulances reported it. The hospitals reported it. That's why we call but, it a loony bin, because the lunar moon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so um, it, I talk about how to use the planets to benefit you. I have toolbox that helps people when they're going through stress and depression. There's many different things that's going to, you know, be in this book that's going to help people that's going through things, but also highlights what working professionals and others are going through as well. So that book will be coming out very soon. As I said, that's the platform. And also my Cabe and Air um, um, site will be coming up soon. And that site also will be helping people that's going through stress, depression, traumatic events and trauma. Well done. I'll definitely be buying the book. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I hope you have me back anyway when the book is ready. Of definitely. course. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Talk yeah. About it more in detail. Definitely. So please let us know what you thought of this video today. Uh, leave your comments. Huge thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. And also, huge thank you to Nick as well. Thank you for, Nick, yeah. for arranging this, and we'll also have the links to his channel down there as well. So yeah, brilliant man. Fantastic. Thank you. Well done. Right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you thank so you. much. Well, that was wicked. Joke, no, Definitely. absolutely brilliant. Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Jen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on Organic Cotton Clothing dot co dot uk